I heard you were inspired to become an actor because of the Ewoks. Is that <laughs> yes. true? <laughs> yes. That's e very I've never true. talked to an actor who was inspired by the Ewoks. <laughs> You know, I thought that was a very specifically me thing as some, you know, <laughs> taking the actor out of it. But when I got older and realized how many Native kids just like, oh, I love the Ewoks, too. <laughs> There's something about the Ewoks that really appeals to little res kids and little urban kids, you know, little Native kids. Like two of my cousins, they're, um, they're, they're twins. And when they were younger, it's like we were all just very rotund little kids and they have very curly hair. And they were people called them the Ewoks. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's um, it, it's certainly true. You know, I, I can't necessarily point to like a moment where it was just like that. But I do remember the con the conceptualization of like Ewoks are actors and therefore actor is what I must do if I will be an Ewok. <laughs> and that has worked out. <laughs> Apparently, I, haven't, I mean, I haven't played an Ewok yet. Well, but... you know, there's still time. Knowing Hollywood, I'm sure you'll get the opportunity. <laughs> I would uh, be just happy to be Ewok adjacent. I don't need to like be in a little furry suit or anything. Oh, <laughs> 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 Welcome to the actor's side. Today I'm so happy to have her here. She is an Oscar nominee, a SAG nominee, multi awards already. I first met her all the way back. It seems like years ago at the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> this is a long season, but so much acclaim and deserve praise for Lily Gladstone. Welcome to the actor's side. Well, thank you for having me. And I saw you earlier at the Oscar nominees lunch, and I took a little photo, <laughs> and there you are between oh my God. Christopher Nolan and yep. Martin Scorsese. Yep, in front of Selma, <laughs> in front of America. Yep. Isn't that right cool? There. Yep. <laughs> and that room, Front I mean, row. did you ever imagine that you'd be at, you know, your first Oscar nominee lunch and that's that's the photo? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was like, kept seeing all of these people go up and I was like, oh, I get to stand, I hope I get to stand next to, I hope I get to stand next to, but I was sitting. Like, yeah, was, I know, and you got to sit in the front. Of like the seven chairs they put out. <laughs> but it was fun though, right? You it had a was good time fun. with that. Everyone's a winner there, which I love, and everyone's so happy to see 100%. everyone else. percent Yeah. And we love each other's movies. And that's you know? what I've noticed this year too. I hear everybody walking around saying, oh my God, mm -hmm. I just love that, which is good. You know, it's it is. Good for this business. Yeah, and you know, we're artists. We learn from each other. We, we love what we do right. and getting to see like how other people are doing it, getting yeah. to watch these tremendous stories. These, um, it was a really good year for film. It's really good too. And congratulations on the Golden Globe Thank as well. You. <laughs> she won Best Actress in a Drama. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. I first met you at a party that Apple had for Killers of the Flower Moon mm -hmm. when it debuted. Uh, they had a, like a press party and mm -hmm. things. And I was thinking, I'm watching you and I'm going, like, okay, well, she's clearly going to go the distance here. I could tell. <laughs> You know, you just know Aww. from from this film and this Thank performance. You. But, um, you know, I'm saying, I wonder if she knows how long a haul it is <laughs> here. And it is. It's Very like long haul. nine months since then. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's still, a, you know, a month to go as we speak right. before the Oscars. What What's it been like for you to have jump into the middle of all of this right especially after the strike and not being yeah. able to talk about the film for such a long time it just felt like hit the ground running maybe even in a accelerated I think it was way. right away because i actually mm -hmm. moderated something at the academy with mm -hmm. you and leo and yep. um, and marty it was yep. everybody's birthday that day I yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was like right after the strike they don't waste mm -hmm. time they yeah. don't yeah and it was um i mean just this whole process has been I've been so touched and I feel like for my first studio thing, I've been very spoiled by the way Apple has handled everything. <laughs> Just the sheer fact that every one of these major carpets, every one of these major awards, events, there are Osage people there. 
Yeah. Which is so wonderful. It's, um, you know, this being a real history that has current day effect on living people, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's an open wound really in the community still. And just the outpour of support, um, both ways. Right. You know, it's, that was actually one silver lining of the strike was that it gave, you know, it gave the focus to Osage people who could go and speak for the film before any of the actors could get out there to talk about it. Right. So it was Marty, it was Chris Cote, it was Addie Roanhorse, it was Chad Renfro. It was, you know, it was people who live on the Osage Reservation in Osage County who grew up in the legacy of this history, the story we're telling. Yeah. And I mean, I'm also just so happy that you know sharing this historic nomination with scott george and that there are osage people nominated as well and they're going to perform you mentioned scott george who wrote the a song that is nominated mm -hmm. for original song i got a chance to talk to him uh in a zoom last week and he is so he's so amazing mm -hmm. you know and talking about this and i said are you going to be singing it on the academy awards and he goes well i'm not sure and i go like Buddy, I think you better prepare. <laughs> <laughs> There's a billion people watching and, mm -hmm. you know, he's so excited. And it's such a, that's a historic nomination too. Sincerely, actually. it really is. That it's Scott George, that it's all the Osage singers, that it's, you know, it's a Southern style drum, Southern style song and, you know, surrounded, have, just that they're surrounded by women. Yeah. So, um, a lot of those, a lot of those songs that I've, I've learned down south are very much the men carry them. Uh -huh. um, but there's always like, there's always a very beautiful featured song that has all of the women singers that stand around the outside. So it's just the fact that this song was composed with women singers alongside, and yeah. just yeah, it's it's an incredible thing because I mean, as an original song, it's also kind of the way a film is when it's made in community when it's made in a nation you know there were films that were made on my reservation when i was growing up and they become part of the fabric of the culture right yeah just the the fact that the film is there and just um that there were so many people who worked on it so so openly and so with such commitment and you know lent lent so much heart to yeah. to the artistry of what we were all doing there it's and just, it was so important i mean in is. my review i called it a landmark motion picture and mm -hmm. what i meant by that was I, I know all these movies that have been made mm -hmm. in Hollywood, right. and it's got a sorry reputation. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does. It's taken a long time. Do you look at this as finally uh, and, and a, a new uh, way of doing it, or is this just the beginning? Is this just telling Hollywood something that maybe it didn't realize in its whole past? Yeah. There? And I feel like people in Hollywood are waking up to that because the industry is getting more diverse. Yeah. The, um, the number of Academy voters has gotten more diverse. Oh, wait, yeah. Um, the, the people who are in positions to green like projects are more diverse. It's yeah. just, and it's as it should be. It's, you know, an ecosystem needs multiple species to stay healthy. It needs multiple life yeah. uh, sustaining, like inner balance, interconnected. It needs diversity. Yeah. And the cultural landscape which is largely like held and shaped by the stories that we tell and consume mm -hmm. that needs to be diverse as well yeah. you know it's like you get a monoculture and then that's how you get these systems that really only make it possible for a select few to um to have major influence in society yeah. and it's you know it's better for all of us when we have diverse stories when we have a broad look at what our history is yeah. um, when we can redefine, you know, it's like I, I'm still so hesitant to try and call our film a Western as is Marty, but redefining what people think of as a Western, you know, yeah. it's not just cowboys and Indians. There have been like people in the American West right. since like there have been anybody who's arrived to this continent, you know, and yeah. there's been. Well, you're driving cars in this. They don't drive cars in most Westerns. That exactly. We've seen. You don't see Indians with money in most Westerns that <laughs> right. we've seen. You don't center Native women and you don't yeah. give them these, uh, these, you know, Olivia de Havilland type like right. screen moments. You know, yeah. it's, it's for, um, I think that's one reason that it, another reason it makes it such a landmark film and why 
You know, people are just so shocked that this history is not more known. Shockingly, it's, it's not known. And it was a mm -hmm. hundred years ago. Right. But, you know. It and was, I mean, it's one thing to hear like little facts about it, yeah. but when you're invited into the home of Ernest and Molly, when you see the inside of that relationship, when you meet Molly's sisters, you see her love for her community, you see the grief of losing each other, you see the human beings, in, you know, or at least a, a story depicting the human beings that, lit, that went through all of that, you, you, you have an empathetic connection with the story and then the history feels real. And what, cause there's, I mean, there's so much that, um, is so hard to conceptualize when you just hear it as a fact, or maybe just like read a small piece of it or, you know, hear an anecdote maybe. Cause I mean, we have, um, we have, as Marty depicts in the end of the film, a lot of pulp fiction that came out of the reign of terror. We have the FBI story that the FBI paid for starring Jimmy Stewart. I, and, uh, right, and that was in the 50s. Oh, God. And I, I it, it was on, I, I got to watch it either on the Westerns channel or TCM or some, oh like, God. it was last fall, I think, in anticipation of the movie coming out. I saw it was popping up a lot. Uh -huh. um, the FBI story. So I was like, all right, I want to see what this is about. It was just, it was insane. Yeah. Like, the, the amount of erasure that happened, it's like you have native actors, presumably, um, possibly not, just kind of drifting through the background. And it's so much about, you know, just this, and Ernest was so sniveling and so like, right. you know, just like, there's this trope in the old Westerns of fate worse than death. Mm -hmm. um, you see it in Natalie Wood's character in The Searchers. In The Searchers, for yeah. sure. That, that's one of the most famous. I right, think. Yeah. right. Being captured by the Comanche is a fate worse than death to then yeah. like have to live with the Indians. I know. And like the, and the way that... by John Wayne. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a great film. It's just a flaw when you look at it through the lens yeah. of today. And yeah, all of that. I mean... It's yeah. a cinematic like masterpiece, masterpiece but then yeah. at the heart of that, it's like, I know cringe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so interesting. What I thought was so interesting about this, and you talk about your relationship with Ernest and everything, the women actually, you know, are very much aware and they're very much in charge in, in a lot of yeah. ways. They, they own it, you know, and, and you know what's going on with him, you know, and what I thought was really interesting watching both of your performances as it evolves is you know, hmm, is he worse than we see? Mm. Is she on to it? You know, you we're seeing you change, you know, your right. facial, the way you play it, which is very interesting. Yeah. And there was a, there was another guiding light that we had outside of Grand's material, um, Killers of the Flower Moon. There was also A Pipe for February by Charles Redcorn. Uh huh. And that was from an Osage perspective during the Reign of Terror. And right. just like, you can, you can feel it in the book. Yeah. Like there's the um, transition to having this great wealth after, you know, Molly was the first generation that was born in Oklahoma mm -hmm. after community, after the nation had been relocated from, um, from the Ohio River area. Yeah. And, you know, so there was a great collective trauma in that, having yeah. left your ancestral lands and being relocated to this place that they had the foresight to buy because then they wouldn't be moved again. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, um, Sorry, and then you have the Robert De Niro character, who's a true con man, mm -hmm. the one that, you know, they liked because he came in yeah. and sort of conned them. Yeah, uh, he did. I mean, so. William Hale learned the language. You know, he yeah, insisted exactly. until the day he died he was innocent. There were Osages at his funeral who believed that he was innocent and believed yeah. him to be a friend. And, like, you see that crop up a lot. The way that Hale didn't just feel entitled to the money and the land of Osage people, he almost felt entitled to the culture. Yeah. Like he wanted to be Osage and he could hold this like, this incredibly paternalistic, but also very sadistic, like uh, authoritarian, like command yeah. over all that he saw. Yeah. And it's like he, you know, my good friends who were my age that I made um, while making the film who were Osage, so, several of them have mentioned how, um, like, you know, William Hale almost became like Voldemort back there. He was cut out of pictures. 
-hmm. after the reign of terror people wouldn't speak about him wow. so it wasn't really until grand's book that several people in my generation who are osage learned about him and yeah. you know the um of course the that's was a big focus of some of these pulp fiction stories that had come out of the reign of terror but there it was just um you know osage culturally also have a world view about um just moving forward yeah like there's this in the film it's depicted this moment it's just it's it's a beautiful and heartbreaking moment of th these women of myself janae collins and a local lady margaret sisk who are um wailing it's uh, crying like yelling and it's like just oh. loudly grieving uh, the death of lizzie the mother and that was Osage practice for a lot of years that not many people do. Um, it's not really something that has uh, has maintained. Yeah. Um, but doing so in the film, it was uh, when it was contextualized to me, and also just really had a lot to do with how Molly was played. You know, the community, like I said, collectively had experienced this trauma of relocation, had experienced this collective trauma of going to boarding schools and like having language like you know um yeah. eradicated culture eradicated um had gone through so much at that point in history and to have at this time you, know, you see it in the film this transition of molly's world changing around her of osage life changing around them and you feel it in charles redcorn's book as well this um you grieve it you have your moment with it and then you just move forward you move on you can't go backwards yeah. it's, i think the saying is the river goes forward it doesn't go backward so um once the reign of terror was over once the guardianship program was ended and a lot of the murders stopped um a lot of people just moved forward with it and in the book being published and in surfacing a lot of these stories you know got people talking again it got people um you know in a way like when you're doing pieces like this you absolutely don't want to re traumatize or bring up old things that people want to let lay yeah. but then there's also a lot of folks who have talked about sharing these stories is how we heal from them yeah. and exactly and this that's why this is so mm -hmm. important and, and it's you said it's your first studio film mm -hmm. you, I, you you of course have done so much great independent filmmaking and thank you you've been in this awards thing before you won awards for a certain women yeah. which is wonderful kelly reichardt thank you. picture and thank you. you know and done a lot of work but this takes it to another level of people being able to experience it right for you yeah 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 it's um and it's been immense like certain women filmmakers loved and people who really love independent film love and still like very much connect with but it's been remarkable now that killers of the flower moon has been out and has been accessible for a long enough amount of time just the people that i run into in my daily life who now recognize me yeah. you know like um like uh, waiters at restaurants or you know, people I see in baggage claim at the airport. And um, by and large, a lot of the folks who approach me or want to like say hello to me come from communities who are marginalized. Mm. And just like, I see, I mean, I see myself when, when they look at me and feel like they had such a connection with the movie and this moment in history and what it's doing for, you know, for native people and native representation right. and how much that's meaning to everybody and not all of these people that i meet are native but you know they they express they come from a community and they understand what this feels like or they understand what this means and that this feels like it's for them yeah. it's like i mean it's like how i felt when keisha castle hughes was nominated for whale rider it oh, was um absolutely it and was, that was a shocker at the time i know the mm -hmm. distributors were going like <laughs> how'd that happen and, and it was lead actress yeah and they thought they were promoting her for supporting uh, because which is you know, wild as a young kid that's right, the way yeah, they think it's like the safer bed yeah. or whatever it's Tatum like... O'Neill Paper Moon even right. though she had more lines than Ryan O'Neill and was, exactly. was the lead exactly <laughs> there is a certain level and it's unfortunate because supporting roles are so meaningful but there's like an infantilization that happens with that and I think yeah. a lot of people get saddled with that infantilized view that outsiders and then, have you know, and there was the a lot of talk about you like oh a lot of the pundits um, like me, mm -hmm. uh, we're speculating, oh, well, the show will go for uh, supporting or whatever. And, you know, and I go like, well, that to me 
would have been number one wrong, because I think <laughs> you're a partner with Leo and with Robert De Niro in terms of carrying this film, and you're the lead uh, female character in it, without question. But all those wonderful, truly supporting women in right. this yeah. would have been, you know, yeah. wiped off. You and know. that brought a little bit more attention to them, absolutely. Absolutely. Tantu Cardinal, my mm -hmm. God, I've talked to her now three times at different Legacy. events. I'm just blown away by that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, I mean, the moments that she has in the film just ground it oh. for, like, an entire generation in this transition between... Yeah her world and her, her return to that at the yeah. end. I mean, emotionally for me in the film, that's, that's what gets me. And, and that's, there's so much emotion in this mm -hmm. movie. There's also humor too, which I like yeah. too. I think that's important. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, 100%. And we talked yeah. about that, the four sisters. And it's something that like natives talk about a lot is people who spend any time in Indian country and in groups of natives like remark, I mean, Leo remarked on it just while we were filming about how much we laugh when we're together. Because right. the way that we're shown in films, the way that, you know, people, because for some reason, people only speak about us in the past tense yeah. or when we speak about ourselves, hear us in the past tense. Right. It's like there's this, this failure to recognize that we're still very much here. Um, I think people assume that we're still these, you know, these cigar store Indians or these yeah. Indians in tin types. <laughs> I know. And that's a big thing. It's like, of course, we all look stoic. You have to look stoic in a tin type. You can't move when your photo's yeah. being taken. <laughs> but I remember when I was going through research with Leo, we, we got to see this incredibly long panoramic that's not published anywhere. Right. Like, um, I did take a picture of it, but, you know, the museum asked me not to post it because it's in the archives and it's never yeah. been been brought to light. Wow. But there's a it's William Hale is in it. He's about this big in the photo because everybody in the photo is about that big. It takes up a whole table and oh it's a God. line of multi tribes who came together in Osage County for, yeah. you know, and there were Ponca there. Didn't have to travel far. There were Lakota there. But you could tell you could see like all these delegates of people that had been sent for this gathering of nations. Yeah. For um, probably, this was past, this was after the treaty days, but something. There was some big doings that brought all these folks together. And at the very end, um, there were these, these three women that were sitting together. And I was just like, that's the sisters. That's what we have to show. Because yeah. while everybody else who's there is very stove up and stoic, it was full sunlight. So I think just like the flash and the sun was right. enough. Nobody had to be stoic in that photo. <laughs> Yeah. You see these three Osage women, you can tell by the by the blankets they're wearing and how they're wearing them, they're Osage. They're sitting together and they're looking at whoever the camera person is and it looks like they're making fun of him. They're like cracking up <laughs> and looking at, I assume him, maybe her, but they're looking at the photographer laughing and wow. there's like a little girl next to them who's got a 1920s haircut and her 1920s dress and um, these these three women that are laughing and I mean one of the most meaningful things there too, and I hope this is like an angle that representation continues to take. If we're breaking stereotypes about who native people are and what we look like, I mean, very clearly sitting next to these ladies is a black Osage woman. Mm. Like yeah. there's there's a lot of Afro indigenous identity in this country that's very like central so to who we are. Different identities. Actually, oh yeah, right? so many, so I mean, many. Which is amazing, nobody knows that. Nobody mm -hmm. like thinks about that. This humanizes them, mm -hmm. and, and you're central to that in, in this. Even when you're not on screen, which I think that's where they would say, well, you could be supporting just because you're not on screen. No, this character is there for the entire three and a half hours. You're, mm -hmm. you're thinking about her, and you don't right. even realize she's not, but it's so yeah. invested in her, and that, that's yeah, key. Patty Smith said, like, the new moon. You don't see it, but you feel it. That's 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 so key in, in, in this, I thought, mm -hmm. um, and and why it's the three of you and we're right. filling. And I think Marty Scorsese was very conscious of Absolutely. that, right? And yeah. involving you in and your opinions and everything in the making of the film. Too. Very much, like he said, he said several times now he couldn't imagine it without me, and like I can't imagine the film without Molly. Right. You know, I was I was blessed enough to be able to carry her through this. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that was another one of the, the supporting versus lead conversations. It's like I have no concern over what's a better or a more surefire shot for me. <laughs> yeah. It's it would 
this is about this is the reign of terror and molly is the most featured osage and character it's like there's you can't do that to her it doesn't always happen in this uh seasons right. that we have of, of awards it all gets very calculated this is kind of the appear i thought michelle williams last year with fable yeah. was too yeah you know she said look Absolutely. mothers don't get the attention or anything this yeah. is a key role yep. and and it worked for her too so exactly. <laughs> stick to your guns <laughs> before we go i have to ask you you got into acting through theater you did a lot mm -hmm. of theater right and yep. all of that I heard you were inspired to become an actor because of the Ewoks. Is that yes. true? <laughs> yes. E I've never true. talked to an actor who was inspired by the Ewoks. <laughs> you know, I thought that was a very specifically me thing as some, um, you know, <laughs> taking the actor out of it. But when I got older and realized how many Native kids just like, oh, I love the Ewoks too. There's something about the Ewoks that really appeals to little res kids and little urban kids, you know, little Native kids. Like two of my cousins, they're... um. They're, they're twins and when they were younger it's like we were all just very rotund little kids and they have very curly hair and they were people called them the Ewoks <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's um it, it's certainly true you know I, I can't necessarily point to like a moment where it was just like that but I do remember the con the conceptualization of like Ewoks are actors and therefore actor is what I must do if I will be an Ewok <laughs> and that has worked out <laughs> Apparently, I, haven't, I mean, I haven't played an Ewok yet. Well, you know, there's still time. Knowing Hollywood, I'm sure you'll get the opportunity. <laughs> I would uh, be just happy to be Ewok adjacent. I don't need to, like, be in a little furry suit or anything, but... And you have another movie before we go. Let me mention it, Fancy Dance. Thank you. Um, which yes. is another, uh, a movie I missed at Sundance. It wasn't even this year. It was uh, last yeah. year. And yeah, finally, and I think largely in part to you, too, uh, it got distribution. Thank you. And uh, and people yeah. are going to be able to see it in theaters. What does that movie mean to you, uh, Fancy Dance? Oh, and I'm just, I'm so grateful people will be able to see it. And we'll be able to see it in company with Killers of the Flower Moon. Right. I mean, it takes place on the same land a hundred years later. And a lot of the issues haven't changed. Yeah. It's um, at the heart of it is a missing, murdered indigenous woman's story. And... You know, it's very, you mentioned Paper Moon earlier. Yeah, yeah. It's got very much a Paper Moon feel oh, really? to it. Oh, it's wow. an aunt and a niece. Um, so, yeah. you know, getting to play auntie in the way that a lot of our matriarchs and our communities do, we're the ones who take care of everything. You know, not just taking care of feeding people, housing people, um, getting kids to school, taking care of the things that the FBI won't. Right. Um, like my character Jax is on the search for her missing sister. And it's just too familiar a story for too many Native families that when you report somebody in your family who's missing, they sleep on it for way too long. I mean, and jurisdictionally, the FBI are the only ones who are able to do these sorts of searches, to do these sorts of things. It's so, it's left on, the burden is left on community. Um, and just by and large, it's it's community or organized search parties. It's community led effort to find what happened to to our sisters. And this one's in correlation with, um, you know, also when we were making it at the time, we were kind of on pins and needles waiting for the Supreme Court ruling on the Indian Child Welfare Act to come in. Luckily, it's been upheld. Yeah. But just our right as nations to raise our own kids yeah. systematically um, for a number of years. There's just a pipeline of kids being adopted away from their families into white families. Yeah. And a lot of it was church led. Um, a lot of, you know, the social work profession was built around in the early days, you know, coming up with um, these assessments for basically how to extract Native kids away from their families. You know, and, the same thing's happening in Ukraine. The Russia's taken all these kids. Yeah. And they've taken them and just put them in other. It's it's yeah, astounding. It's a very old divide and conquer tactic. It's just like it's yeah. so. That's another conversation, but that mm -hmm. is so depressing that still right. after all this time. So it's very much a theme and fancy dance as well. But at the heart of it still is this this matrilineal love. This um, you know when I was speaking about it when I was accepting my IndieWire performance award and kind of pulled that fast one. Um, <laughs> Because you really can, every, you know, the only reason that worked is it all, it all applies to Killers of the Flower Moon as well, which is why 
I could say everything that I said about fancy dance that evening, but it is, you know, all that to say this, it is the great love story I've been able to tell in my career is the love that my character has for her niece, for her sister, for her language, for her community. Um, and she's not a perfect protagonist because that's the other thing is native actors, now that we're having a moment, we want to play complex characters. Mm -hmm. We want to play that we're the products of our environment. Um, we want to have real conversations, you know, like we want to, you know, we don't forget anybody either. It's like people, um, yeah, well, people, it's... people can be imperfect, but what keeps you together is a love of each other. And what keeps you moving forward is a love of your way of life. And I think this film, in a very uh, Paper Moon meets Thelma and Louise kind of a treatment, <laughs> has these really big conversations well, that that's very great. much tie to, to um, if you wanted to see more of the sisters' relationship in Killers of the Flower Moon, you'll feel, you'll feel satisfied after watching this Fancy Dance. Can't wait. I'm so happy. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the actor's side, Lily Gladstone. Oh, it's so good to be here. Thank you for having me.